who is your favorite speaker and why? Uh, I would have to say Father. Um, I think the topic of exorcism, the demonic, has been glossed over. In our modern world, we kind of tend to try and explain everything away. Um, we do have to understand that, you know, these things are real and that sometimes people need help that's beyond medical expertise um, and so it's a good reminder and lesson for everybody which one was your favorite and why well for me the father was my favorite because of the way his conviction that he had it was just so powerful you could feel the passion the love he has for his ministry and more than anything the info that i was getting it was so like educational i learned so much there that i want to apply in my life it gave me like that that push you know like that motivation <laughs> Anything, he talked a lot about the demonic. Is there anything that sort of like struck you? Look, to me, what I, what I, what I liked how he talked in, he went in depth in that because a lot of that, like, I haven't really heard a lot about. I've learned a lot about God, but talking about the demonic, it's kind of like something, a topic that we kind of just avoid a little bit. And I like the fact how he went talking about the different doorways, how we open the door to the demonic and how we can affect that and how we can not open those doorways. I really like that. I liked how he went in depth with that. He brings in a touch of reality to something that we as supposedly modern enlightened human beings, as he said, don't take very seriously. Um, I remember when I watched the movie The Ride for the first time, I had a lot of questions in my head. And then when I realized that he was the um, exorcist of San Jose, and he actually came to my university, St. Mary's, when I was going there, opened up a lot of questions, you know, the realities of, of um, spiritual warfare as it, as it is. <laughs> All right, please welcome Father Gary Thomas. upon the talk that I'm about to deliver this morning and also the gathering in solidarity of so many young adults and people of various ages and backgrounds but in solidarity with the faith and the hope that not only will this talk but this entire day be transformational as Brian mentioned for all of us through Christ our Lord. Amen. I want to begin this morning by sharing with you a personal experience that happened just the other day and it's not normally how I begin my talks I have a variety of talks and I do give uh, presentations at Newman centers which are the Catholic parishes and colleges around the United States and parishes and I go and give workshops sometimes to uh, gatherings of priests in in diocese but last Monday I had been asked to do a radio talk show with a radio program in Dublin, Ireland. And the week before, the person who called me representing the station asked if in light of some statements that were made by a Vincentian priest in Ireland about the need for the bishops of Ireland to appoint more exorcists because in Ireland, uh, there's a tremendous amount of evil that is becoming more and more apparent to people. Ireland just recently passed an abortion law that permits abortion. The country itself has gone through this terrible, awful uh, sexual abuse scandal amongst the clergy. There has been a tremendous drop-off in participation in the life of the church in terms of Catholics. And the church in Ireland in general is in a real state of emergency. So when the man called me and said, would you be willing to um, come on this radio program and answer some questions and discuss this? I said, sure. And I've done this many times before. So the person who asked me was very congenial, very polite, very nice, very warm. The person who is the talk show host was the absolute opposite 
in terms of his personality, his agenda, and he was everything but gracious. And so when they originally asked me, well, can you, how long could you speak? And I, I said, you know, I said, well, what are you looking at? Well, could you do 15 minutes? I said, well, geez, 15 minutes is hardly very much time. If you want, I could do something like 45. So I did a 45 minute Q&A on this talk show. The man's name, I won't give you his whole name. His first name is Niall. And Niall, it turns out, somebody wrote to me the next day from Ireland and apologized for the manner in which I was treated on the phone. This man has been a very angry individual, claims some Catholicism, but really a largely a rejection of it, and spent the 45 minutes basically trying to debunk the existence of Satan and that aren't all of these manifestations and these claims Aren't these all simply about people who have mental disorders? And isn't all of this now the, to believing, the belief and the teaching of the church about Satan? Wasn't that meant for a different time because people were not so educated? And because people are now very educated, there's no longer a need to have any belief in the existence of Satan or personified evil. So that was kind of the general gist of the specific questions. But every time I began to give an answer, he would interrupt me. And so finally, after the third interruption, I said to him, I would be most grateful if you would stop interrupting me so that I could actually finish the answer you're seeking before you ask me another question. And then I went on to say, this entire interview has been dripping in sarcasm and snarkiness from the very first moment you asked me the first question. And he says, well, yes, I am. I am very skeptical. And I said, well, actually, the antiphon at the School of Exorcism in Rome is that the exorcist must be the ultimate skeptic. However, what is not at all skeptical is that not only do we teach and believe in personified evil, but we also have the scriptures which we believe to be the truth of the mind and the heart of God. We have the scriptures as our resource and our reference. So then, to, make, to take it to the next level, he says to me, well, how do we know that Jesus was the Messiah? There were many messiahs in Jesus' day. And what makes Jesus so special? So, of course, my, my, sort of my Catholic blood was beginning to kind of, kind of percolate a little bit, and also in the same breath, I'm a public figure, and I'm a public servant, and I'm on, I'm not sure how far this radio station in Dublin broadcasts, but I was not going to let this man, in a sense, kind of get under my skin, so to speak. I said, the difference between all these messiahs and Jesus is that Jesus is the messiah. And so he said, well, how do we know? How do we know he's the Messiah? How do we? I says, he's God. Well, how do we know he's God? I says, because the scriptures so tell us he's God. Well, there was no one there who actually is around anymore to be able to, to tell us whether or not that is true. And I says, we have the Synoptic Gospels in which Mark, Mark's two primary sources were the Blessed Mother and St. Peter, at which he said, to the listening audience. Well, we want to thank Father Gary Thomas for coming on this morning and being able to share with us his point of view. I mean, it, it stopped him. I share that experience with you because that is, in a sense, the climate that we as Catholic Christians and Christians in general 
who are not lukewarm, to Brian's point, who are not lukewarm, what we are facing as a church that is embattled, under siege, but protected. When I became the mandated exorcist in 2005, it was rather by providence, but at the time when the opportunity was made available, I did not know what I was saying yes to. I don't have any regrets about becoming the exorcist and saying yes. When the opportunity presented itself, I said, I could, I could be the exorcist. I believe in the personification of evil. I could do that job. Now, that was what I said. I realize it's a ministry, but it was a very flippant, offhanded conversation with a priest who had been asked by our bishop and had politely said no. And so when I went to Rome and I took the course, one of the people I met at the course, there were three Americans in the course, um, mostly Italian priests, African sisters, Matt Balio, who wrote the book and the movie, and, and was the, the book that was then later became a movie, happened to be the only lay person who was taking this course simply out of curiosity. And so what was most apparent was that while I was taking the course, the other, the other person who was there, the other American, happened to be a Franciscan priest who was working under an exorcist in Rome, and it would come and tell all of these incredible stories on Thursday mornings at class. So to make a long story short, I went out and found an exorcist, Father Carmen de Vipolis, the Francis, uh, pardon me, a Capuchin, who then I worked under for three and a half months, and I, I observed about 80 exorcisms. So then when I came home back to the Diocese of San Jose and assumed my current pastorate, I had a, a real basic but I think a very solid grounding in what this ministry was about, is about, and at least to begin to recognize some of the signs as well as some of the doorways that people open, most of the time through no fault of their own, but in the culture in which we live now, the faith optic of many of us has grown increasingly thin. So, because of the movie and the book, I get emails and phone calls from all over the world. Now, I'm only responsible for the people of God in my diocese. However, very, very often, when people are calling from the, around the United States or even outside the United States, or more often than not an email, they are experiencing a kind of suffering that in some cases, social science has not been able to help them or even the local church hasn't had any kind of apparatus that would give them the kind of pastoral care that they need. And so because I happen to have a list of the confidential, a confidential list of the exorcists in the United States, or at least one that's relatively recent, what myself and my team attempt to do is to wreck them back to their local church. So very often the first question that I get asked on the phone, pardon me, that the first statement that is made on the phone is, Father, I need an exorcism. And my pat answer to them is, I don't do them on request. There's a protocol. So in the pastoral care of the church, when people are seeking healing, which is primarily what the ministry of exorcism is really all about. Yes, there is drama. Yes, what you see sometimes in the movies is somewhat accurate, but primarily and fundamentally, the ministry of exorcism and deliverance is about the ministry, an aspect of Christ's healing. And so my role and the goal of the teams that I work with is to get to the root cause of people's suffering. Because every single person who calls or emails is suffering, either from a spiritual malady, a psychiatric issue, a psychological issue, sometimes a physical issue, or a spiritual issue. And in that spiritual issue may or may not be one that is, has a tie to the demonic. And so my role is to get what is the root cause of this particular individual's suffering. 
And so we have a protocol whereby if they're from our diocese, we invite them in. We have a, basically an intake questionnaire and we ask questions per se with respect to what was it like growing up in your home? Tell me about your family dynamic. Help us understand what were your teenage years and your later years like. Have you had, and again, then we get into the whole issue of the doorways. And that's primarily what the talk is about this morning. So we ask, very, we ask questions with respect to people's active life, if they're Catholic. Not everybody who comes to me is Catholic because Satan isn't choosy. So if a person has opened a door, if a person has gone down a path whereby they've gotten off the rails, they've been distracted, and they're looking for answers to questions or they're looking for power over their life. And that's what the occult and the new age are actually all about, power and knowledge, but artificial power and knowledge. Those doorways can look very attractive. So while most of the people who come to me or come to the team are Catholic, it's not simply only Catholics who seek out our services. I have a prayer team with whom I work who are present in every one of our deliverances and exorcisms. I never do any of this ministry alone. In fact, it is, it's in, this ministry is intrinsically collaborative. And there is a very significant role for the laity to play in this ministry. So on the prayer team, I have three married couples. I have several single men. And, I, and some of them are bilingual, bicultural, because of the fact that we have a bilingual, bicultural diocese like most every place else in California. And so sometimes we have people who come to us whose first language is not English. We want to certainly be able to accommodate them. And then as well, I have some professionals. I have a physician. I have two clinicians, two clinical psychologists, two psychiatrists. One, is, one clinician is bilingual, one psychiatrist is bilingual. We have a medical doctor who happens to be the doctor for the San Francisco Giants, but that wasn't why I picked him. <laughs> and so part of the discernment is what is the root cause of this person's suffering. And so in the process of the conversation and the interviews, which then are usually followed up by deliverance prayer, which is part of the, so to speak, the discernment. We're always looking to see what might have been a toehold or a foothold that a praetor natural, in other words, a demonic entity may have gained entrance into this person's life. So what I want to do I want to give you nine forbidden practices of the occult. So amongst the questions that we ask, have you ever had an abortion? Have you ever, been, have you ever participated in an abortion? One of the forbidden practices of the occult is human sacrifice. Abortion is a demonic sacrifice. Satan hates the human race. He hates every one of us out of jealousy and rage. So where in fact did this intelligent being Satan, where did he come from? I was in the classroom at our school yesterday teaching our kids and one of the kids in the fourth grade said, well, why did God make Satan? So I did a little and when I go to the classrooms, this is not something I regularly talk about with the kids. We do oftentimes a question and answer, but the kids were curious. So I'm always trying to speak to them at a very child age friendly level. So I was able to answer that in a way that was not scary, was not spooky, where they would go home and tell their mom and dad or something that their mom and dad might be concerned about. I said, God didn't create Satan. God created Lucifer, which means angel of light. 
and Lucifer's rejection of God was out of a sense of jealousy and envy because of God's decision to create the human race of which we are of a lower nature than the angelic. The angels are more powerful than we are. They're more intelligent than we are. Their sense of free will is much keener than ours and they have no corporeal bodies, they're pure spirits. But in the 12th chapter of Revelation, it, it gives an account of how the rebellion in heaven took place and Michael led the angels against Satan and a third of the realm who were opposed to God's sovereignty, all because of the creation of the human race. And so, Lucifer's name became changed, not by something per se in the Bible, but the word Satan comes from the Hebrew me, Satan meaning adversary. And so as Lucifer no longer was in league with God, he became opposed to God. And therefore his relationship with God changed thus his name. So, abortion, human sacrifice, that very much was in line with what was going on in the Old Testament prior to Jesus as it applied to cultures in which the Israelites, who later became the Jewish nation, became engaged with, entangled with, intermarried with, and oftentimes in the history of Israel, they themselves became very idolatrous. Another doorway, which we would certainly ask, would be about divination. And so the manipulation by demonic forces. And so very, very often, and I have to say in the ministry that I'm involved in now, before this began 12 years ago, I knew very, very little if almost nothing about the activities of Satan in a fashion that I can speak about today. When I was pastor in my former parish at St. Nicholas in Los Altos, I remember when the, when the event of nine, events of 9-11 happened and I preached at all the masses that weekend on how 9-11 was a demonic event. Why? Because of the premeditated nature of what those 19 men and probably many others who were part of radical Islam attempted to do in trying to kill as many people as they could at one time in a very premeditated way. A couple years later, when the events at Columbine High School happened, I also preached at all the masses that weekend. Again, on Columbine being a demonic event, why? Because the two young men who were the perpetrators of that mass homicide were both involved in the occult. And so the doorways that we listen for, we talk about divination, we're talking about expressions and rituals that in a sense are cheap imitations to help for people to be able to get answers to questions that sometimes traditional prayer doesn't answer in the immediate. We live, this is no secret, we live in a culture now that is highly technological. People know, including me, we all know information on a moment's notice. And all of that kind of information and the internet itself, while it has done many wonderful good things that has helped our society in, ver in a variety of ways, like anything else that hum human beings create, there's always a shadow side. And so the questions that we would ask after we get through the whole issue of tell us about your family background, tell us about any traumas that you've experienced in your life. For example, sexual abuse. 80% of the people who come to me or come to our team are sexual abuse victims. That's a soul wound. Satan is always looking for people who have broken relationships or no relationships. And very often that wound serves as the doorway through which a demon 
or some other kind of malevolent entity can gain a kind of legal toehold. And so very, very often, as the faith optic of our Catholic culture and the culture in general, as it applies to issues that are pagan, and that was mentioned in Brian's talk, people oftentimes have been drawn to conjuring instruments such as a Ouija board, which looks very harmless. You can buy them in a toy store. Now yesterday in the fifth grade, when that came up by one fifth grader, he talked about Ouija boards in a way that made me most uncomfortable and worried because he knew way too much for a kid his age as he was sharing with me what the Ouija board was about, which I'm going to go back and have a conversation with him in a very genteel pastoral way and say, what do you know about Ouija boards? Why are you playing Ouija boards? And what can I do to persuade you not to play with the Ouija board? Because it looks harmless. And in the perversion of Satan, there is what we call spiritual warfare. And what is involved in spiritual warfare is the cosmic battle between God and Satan. And they're not equals. This is not like the New England Patriots going up against the Philadelphia Eagles. This is not like the San Francisco Giants going up against the Los Angeles Dodgers. Satan is a preternatural being created by God. God is sovereign. God is divine. However, the cosmic battle is ensuing because Satan already knows he's lost. How do we know that? The cross. The cross is the battle symbol that reminds us that the moment that Jesus breathed his last, Satan's attempt to conquer the human race was defeated. And that's important that we have an understanding of that because Catholicism is a religion of hope. It is not a religion of darkness. It is not a religion that is for the lukewarm. I don't believe that being a Catholic today is something that we cannot exercise other than with a kind of intentionality. Because to exercise our Catholicism well takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of courage, and it takes a decision on our part that we are going to be disciples of Jesus who have a personal relationship with him. And so when we begin public prayers, we began when I began prayer, and when Ryan ended prayer, we begin with the sign of the cross. We take all these symbols, we take them for granted oftentimes. We don't, and I would include myself as well, especially since I've become the exorcist, we don't take into account the power of those symbols when you press them up against the power of evil. Because the power of evil will shirk, will shrink, and will rage when the cross is presented, the Eucharist is presented. If you've ever had a doubt, about whether or not the, the Eucharist is the real deal, when the Eucharist is brought into the presence of someone who is under the influence or the oppression or obsession of Satan or even possession, the reaction is severe. You bring the Eucharist out to feed someone during the course of a deliverance session and the reaction is severe because Everything that we would understand to be sacred, you have to remember Satan would understand in an absolute 360 degree perverted way. So the reaction is severe. The response and the recognition that Jesus is truly present under the forms of bread and wine is unquestionable. And when he uses those words that myself or Father Manuel or any priest prays during the celebration of Mass, the words of institution, this is my body, this is my blood, 
this is not a symbol of, this is. And do this in memory of me. Why? So we don't forget to be thankful for what the cross is about. The cross is about Jesus defeating Satan, sin, and death. And it leads to our salvation. That the moment that Christ died on the cross and then several days later rose makes it possible for us to rise as well. And so the doorways are Satan's legal way, and Satan's a legalist. It's Satan's legal way to make a claim. So Ouija boards, tarot cards, seeking a psychic, going to a medium. What was most interesting on that interview with the man in Ireland was that he got into this little sidebar conversation about conducting a seance in a haunted castle in Ireland and referring to it as simple entertainment. And I said to him, you have no idea of the danger you're putting those people in, including yourself. Because a seance is the conjuring of the soul of a dead person. Now, we teach and believe that when we die, we go and we have a face-to-face -face conversation with Christ. We call that the particular judgment. And in that conversation, it is then determined, and this part we don't know, it is then determined what our final destination is, heaven, hell, or purgatory. Purgatory is the beginning of paradise. Purgatory is not meant to be understood as, well, we didn't make the team, <laughs> and we have to go to the minor leagues. <laughs> what it does mean is that in order for us to be embraced, in, in, conjun in communion with the communion of saints that we have to be dressed appropriately. If you are going to a wedding or you are going to some very special occasion, we all dress as if it is special. In that same way, we all commit sin. The redemption, however, of sin is that Christ's death on the cross makes it possible for us to overcome our sins, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit as it applies to the cross in this ministry. And so tarot cards, mediums, psychics, channeling, crystals, spells, all of those, they're all considered divination, practicing astrology. We have to decide, are we going to practice the ways of the Lord? Or are we going to practice the ways of superstition? People who are enchanters, there are people who claim to be witches. In certain cultures, they have certain names. In the Hispanic culture, they could be considered a curandero or a bruja. And very, very often that word means healer. But when you ask people who are, who claim to be a curandero and a healer, very often they are witches because they've made pacts with the demonic. Because they themselves sometimes, not always, sometimes have spiritual giftings. Those spiritual giftings ideally should be used for the Lord. But very, very often they can be perverted and they can be used for Satan. And so people who are charmers, those are people who manipulate objects or beings being via demonic power. So people can use objects. They can do something as simple as making a verbal pact with Satan. They can go to someone who has certain powers or they claim to have certain powers and make a pact with Satan and then in that relationship, and that's what a pact is, it's a relationship that sometimes people are, are, are deluded into believing that that kind of power is power. There is no free will when one gets involved 
in any kind of relationship with Satan. It's like belonging to the mafia. Once you're in, you can't get out. There are people who, who, who are wizards, and I've had people come talk to me about, I went and saw a wizard, a practitioner of magic. Well, what happened in the magic? That's the kinds of questions we ask. You know, people who are involved in certain kinds of energy, such as going and getting involved with a Reiki master. Reiki is a kind of healing system that's based on ancient Tibetan knowledge discovered by a Japanese theologian. And in Reiki, there are always what's called spirit guides. Well, who are those spirit guides? And then, of course, there's Satanism. Now, Satanism is becoming more out in the open. 30, 40, 50 years ago, it wasn't that there were no Satanists around. It wasn't that all of a sudden this is kind of a, a new 21st century phenomena. It's just that those who practice Satanism now don't no longer see this oftentimes as being very secretive. There are people in Hollywood, such as Beyonce, who herself has publicly said that she made a pact with a spirit. That's why she has all of the talent that she has. And so in all of our culture in a variety of ways, you have these threads of what I call paganism. And that paganism, very, very oftentimes, it looks very benign. It looks very, well, this is just what someone may choose to do. But all of those and many other kinds of practices, those are all, they're all against the second commandment. I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt not have strange gods before me. In the 18th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, Moses clearly says, this is verses 9 through 13, when you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to, to imitate the abominations of the nations there. Let there not be found among you anyone who causes their son or daughter to pass through the fire, to practice divination. And here now, very specific. Or is a soothsayer, or a sorcerer, or who casts spells, consults ghosts and spirits, or seeks oracles from the dead. Anyone who does such things is an abomination to the Lord, and because of such abomination, the Lord your God is dispossessing them before you. You must be altogether sincere with the Lord your God. Although these nations whom you are about to dispose listen to their soothsayers and diviners, the Lord your God will not permit you to do so. So, these kinds of rituals, these kinds of practices, very, very often people dabble. Most of the people who come to me are dabblers. Once in a while, we'll have someone come who's a satanic ritual abuse survivor. Most of the time, people are dabbling around. Why? Because A, prayer doesn't give answers in an instant. And we have become a very instantaneous culture. I mean, I just think of myself. Emails, voicemails, I do not do uh, Snapchats, I don't do tweets, I don't Twitter, I don't, I don't even text. I don't want to be enslaved to all of those electronic techie practices that after a while can become overwhelming. But given that those are meant to be helps to our businesses, to our lives, what it has also done is given, this, given us this delusional sense that everything has to be now. There is no longer the sense of delayed gratification. Everything has to be now. I have to be satisfied now. I have to have the answers to my questions now. I have to have my prayers answered now. 
At our parish, what I've begun to do are two things in the manner in which I celebrate the Eucharist. I very, very often, when we have to pray at the beginning of Mass, I will say as we gather here in solidarity, just like we're here in solidarity this morning, I will, I've begun using that word, I say, for maybe the last four or five years. Why? Because I've become growingly aware that we are becoming more and more individualized. Now, yes, each of us is a child of God and each of us has an individual conscience and each of us is an individual person. But the communal nature of our society and culture and church, which I grew up with, and I'm 64, and I grew up in a parish in South San Francisco with mostly Italians, Hispanics, and Portuguese, and we weren't, but we felt like we were, <laughs> because we were all, all embraced. There was, a, there was a communal sense that's very much at the heart of who we are. We are relational beings. What Satan loves to do is in the seduction of believing that you can get your answers through a soothsayer, through a medium, through tarot card reading, through, a palm, through having someone read your palms, or making a pact somehow with Satan through a witch or some other person who's involved in those kinds of the dark arts, that that's going to give us really what we need and want. What we need and want as people who have been made in the image and likeness of God is relationships with each other. What Satan does is that he isolates. And I know this happens because when people come to me and tell me, I need help, I think I have something spiritually wrong with me, I have something demonically I believe, whether they do or not is beside the question. What that does, it isolates them because they don't know who to go talk to. Because if they use the D word or the E word, people run for the hills. They want nothing to do with them. And they think they're crazy. So when I go and give workshops to the clergy about how to pastorally care for people who come who are suffering these maladies, whether they're imagined or real, one of the first things I say is, you do not blow them off. You do not judge them to be crazy. You do not use that language. You do not say, well, just go see a therapist, or we don't deal with those things anymore, or what sometimes I've heard priests say, not to me directly, well, that's medieval, or the church doesn't teach that or Satan is a metaphor. I'm gonna give you one citation from the, Mark, from the Gospel of St. Mark with regards to that. And in a sense, the, this is from the, from the fifth chapter, and I'm not gonna read the whole chapter, I'm just gonna read part of it. They came to the other side of the sea to the territory of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, at once a man from the tombs who had an unclean spirit met him. The man had been dwelling among the tombs and no one could restrain him any longer, even with a chain. In fact, he had frequently been bound with shackles and chains, but the chains had been pulled apart by him and the shackles smashed and no one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the hillsides, he was always crying out and bruising himself with stones. Catching sight of Jesus from a distance, he ran up and prostrated himself before him, crying out in a loud voice, what have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. Because Jesus had been saying to the man, unclean spirit, come out of the man. Jesus asks him, what is your name? Legion is my name. There are many of us. And he pleaded earnestly with him not to drive them away from that territory. Now, a large herd of swine was feeding there on the hillside, and they pleaded with him, send us into the swine, let us enter them. And he let them, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine. The herd of about 2,000 rushed down a steep bank into the sea where they were drowned. The swine herds ran away and reported the incident in the town and throughout the countryside, and people came out to see what happened. As they approached Jesus, they caught sight of the man who had been possessed by a legion sitting there clothed and in his right mind. 
and they were seized with fear. Now, there's a lot of dynamics in that account that I deal with as an exorcist. First of all, one of this, there's six signs of a demonic condition. I wouldn't say a possession, but a condition. One is the person exhibits inor inordinate strength they don't normally possess. A second one is the, the, the person can speak in a language they have no competency in. The third is n knowledge of hidden things. So how did that man know that this was Jesus? It was because the demon known as Legion spoke through the vessel of the person's voice. Another one is foaming at the mouth, which we don't hear about in this, in this particular case. Another one is you, oftentimes the person will have epileptic-like symptoms where their face distorts and their limbs distort. Now, that's why I have a team. Not just to help make sure that the man does nothing to hurt himself or the woman hurt herself, but also to have the team available to be able to say, what, is, what are these epileptic seizure type manifestations all about? And then finally, the last one is an aversion to the sacred. So somebody who would walk in Our Lady of the Assumption and look at that cross would, how, would feel they needed to run away or they came to receive communion and it would burn as they were consuming it or they came to receive communion and it was so pungent, the smell, that they couldn't go near it or they blessed themselves with holy water and it would burn or during the words of consecration, they would begin to vomit. Those are all signs. So. The man was isolated. He was living among the tombs. He was living there because no one wanted anything to do with him and the chains couldn't restrain him. And in the rite of exorcism, there is a point where I say, what is your name? And the, demon ha the demons have to announce who they are and they'll do everything they can not to. But they have to because I'm the mandated exorcist. And what that means is that the authority to do this, perform this ministry, isn't because of me, Gary Thomas, who is a priest, it's because of the local bishop. And as I've had to share with a few bishops, not because I'm so smart, but because I've learned a few things, the bishop is the chief exorcist of the diocese. The reason that I have authority is because of the Bishop of San Jose. And so the demons recognize that. There's never one demon they always function in a tribe. That's their system. And the doorways, I as the exorcist am always listing for along with my team because eight heads or nine heads are better than one. And sometimes my team will pick up things that I don't pick up on. And that therefore, fundamentally, this ministry in relationship to the Paschal Mystery, the cross, it's all about that. So it's been transformational in the manner in which I celebrate the Eucharist. Because I'm very aware when we gather in solidarity, there is power in numbers. We know that. I was just on the Walk for Life two weeks ago. And I don't know how many thousands of people were there, but that was a mighty force of people. When we gather in solidarity, we are a force for good. And that therefore, as I say to our people, when we gather in solidarity for Mass, I want people to realize you're not here celebrating the Eucharist by yourself because Catholicism is a communitarian religion. And what makes it a religion of hope is that the symbol of Christ crucified on the cross, which may look like he's dead, in fact is a symbol of life. That's why the Stations of the Cross while they might look macabre and they might look like they're all about suffering, the stations of the cross in a sense that, circ that, that surround the assembled body of believers is meant to say that we too are on a journey of faith just like Jesus was. And that journey of faith sometimes involves suffering and that journey of faith sometimes involves surprises. But that journey of faith is always going to, if we believe, that journey of faith is always going to lead us back to the home from which we came, heaven. Now, I mentioned about the, the nine different practices of the occult. I want to give you four ordinary means of protection. I like to do things in numbers. I can remember numbers. A faith life. 
We have a relationship with our Lord. And that determination, that decision on our part to have a relationship with Jesus, to believe that he really was true, was, is, and forever will be, that relationship, in a sense, it what, it's what gives us our purpose in life. What I tell our kids at our school, and they've heard this so many times now, what is the number one, what is the number one goal in life? To get to heaven. They know that. That's our goal. Jesus gives us our life and gives us his presence and revelation in spoonfuls because to get him all at once, we wouldn't be able to deal with the glory of God. It would be too much. And so we get God in spoonfuls through relationships, experiences, ideas, and events. So we have a faith life. And how do we feed that faith life? We have a prayer life. It's like the people you're closest to. How do you get close to them? How do you maintain those relationships? You have to spend time. In the same way we spend time in the Eucharist, at adoration, we spend time in private prayer, we spend time with the sacraments, we spend time with one another because God, the presence of God is found in the church, found in the scriptures, found in the sacraments, found in the person of, of the priest standing at the altar and the person of Christ, found in nature. In order to have that faith life and prayer life, God orders our life in such a way that keeps us on a path toward heaven. That's the moral life. That's basically how do we live? How do we make decisions about what's right and what's wrong? How do we know what's right and what's wrong? We have to have a formed conscience. How do we have a formed conscience? Through prayer, through the teachings of the church, through Bible studies, through being able to educate ourselves. And then what's the armor that keeps the moral life, the prayer life, and the faith life together? It's the sacraments. For us as Catholics, there is an arsenal that makes it possible for us to be protected from the onslaught from the evil one. I don't present these things to say the world is all gloom and doom. It's not. It is to say that we need not take these realities for granted and that these are not metaphorical. The scriptures are the truth. We live in a society and a culture now where we hear about fake news all the time. So very often now we don't know what's true and what isn't. This is true. The scriptures are true. We can depend on their veracity, which is why when the fellow from Ireland the other night, was, uh, the other day was saying to me, well, Jesus is just one of many messiahs. How do we know that he is? I said, because he's God. Well, how do we know that? Because the Blessed Mother and Peter, the primary sources of St. Mark, were the ones who provided Mark with the testimonies that gave truth to Mark. And Matthew and Luke are both based on common sources. Now, we are also blessed in that arsenal to have the Blessed Mother. And the Blessed Mother is the real deal. And I oftentimes will pray to her with our team and invoke her. And invoke her and say, I need your assistance in this deliverance. And she does show up. Now, I don't see her, but oftentimes the person we're praying over will say, I'll say, do you see her? And the person will say, no, but I smell her. Or I feel her. Or I sense her. And we call upon Michael and the, and the angels. Why? Because they're also part of the army that not only was at Christ's disposal and the Father's disposal and the Spirit's disposal, but at our disposal because of the baptism that links us with Christ. And the saints. The saints we call upon as well. And the saints are also part of the army that is there for us to be able to have the kind of relationship with God that they had. And so therefore, as Catholics, we have a very rich both tradition and a set of practices. The doorways we need to be not only aware of, but to be vigilant about. That all of these superstitions and these other perverted rituals and with people who are involved in some of the 
the behaviors that I mentioned in, in the book of, that I mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, it's very easy for us to simply kind of go along for the ride. If somebody shares with you that they've consulted one of these individuals or one of these types of individuals, it's imperative that you caution them against it. Because when people go and they expose themselves in these kinds of practices, what they're doing is they're creating an invitation. Because a possession is a relationship. And it is a relationship very, very dramatically, a perverted one as opposed to Christ. Christ does not interfere in our free will. Christ gives us the respect of our free will, which is intrinsic to our human nature. But Christ is always hoping that we'll choose him. But he leaves it up to us. The question I oftentimes get asked by people is, well, why doesn't, why doesn't God just destroy Satan? Or like one of the kids in one of the classes yesterday, I think it was the fifth grade, said, why didn't Jesus just take Satan out to begin with? And the reason is, is because though Jesus gives Satan boundaries, he wants, he wants to bring a kind of clarity to the direction in our lives that we want. So that the love and the fidelity that we give him is genuine. It's not robotic. It's not based on instinct. It's based on free will. Those doorways are very powerful. When I had people who've been part of satanic ritual abuse come to my door and they share with me and they share with our team some of the incredible traumas that they've undergone, which is all about mind control. That's all that it's about, mind control. And the amount of sexual abuse that goes on in those systems it only reinforces the fact that Satan is not a metaphor. He's real. He's real because Christ came to defeat him. Not the metaphorical understanding of him, not the symbol of evil, the person of evil. That's why it's so important for us as a church to recognize that there is great hope the work that I do, separate from my work as a pastor, the work I do is fundamentally about healing. And in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there are many accounts where Jesus heals in a variety of ways. One of those manners in which he heals is that he did perform exorcisms and he did liberate and free people from the oppression that they were under. The more we can be aware of the doorways that are potentially destructive to our personal life and our faith life, and the more vigilant we are with regards to that, and the more discerning that we are, the far better chance that we have to be able to live as freely as one of God's children. And coming together in solidarity this morning, I hope will give a reinforcement that none of us is walking this journey all by ourselves, but that our baptism, the reception of the Eucharist, our confirmation, our identity as Catholics gives us a reassurance that we are not alone on this journey. Christ clearly is with us, but when we know that there are other people, other fellow Catholics of various ages who as well want, yearn for, hunger for, and desire that relationship with Jesus because he is the way, the truth, and the life. The news that we oftentimes hear today, we're not so sure about, but we can certainly be assured that Christ crucified makes it possible for the world to be liberated from the darkness and evil that is also part of our free will, with the choices that we sometimes make and that those choices that others make, we don't have to make. Those choices that we make, hopefully, are in tandem with the God who created us, saved us, 
loves us, makes us holy, and wants us to have a complete union with him ultimately in heaven.